everybody, and welcome to episode 9 of The Frankie Files. Today is a very special broadcast. You'll be hearing from not just me, but two people who successfully recovered from a cult. The cult is called Morningland Church, and this is the first time that we've been public speaking about it ever, so it's quite significant. My job is not to tear up during this podcast. My special guest today is my mom. We took very different paths in recovering, and that's what we're going to talk about. But for 20 plus years, I did not talk about what happened to us with her or any of my other family. Today, I'll have my first public conversation with my mom about the cult we both survived, Morningland. Morningland Church sometimes called Church of the Ascended Christ, but always Morningland, is in Long Beach, California. Those of you who download this podcast, who also went there, uh, we'd love to interview you in the future, so please get in touch with me through frankietees.com. As a preface, backstory, Morningland was founded in 1974. I left in the 80s after my mom was kicked out. She was also kicked out in the 80s. I was there from 74 to late 80s. At some point after both founders died, it was renamed the monastery, which is what it's called now. But make no mistake, it's still run by the people, the clergy who was trained by the founders, and they hurt a lot of people. What you're about to listen to is a personal milestone for both parties. It's a huge pleasure and a long journey for me to introduce to you my mom. Hi, mom. Hi, number one. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Don't you forget it. How are you? Uh, this is, like you said, a very monumental uh, situation for us. We're both teary-eyed today because we've worked really, really hard. Now, don't you start on me. <laughs> but it's true. Uh, we've been through a lot. We've been through a lot. And ours is a cautionary tale. Families are separated in cults. And many times they never get back together. We're an exception. And it took us so long. And it took us many tears and arguments to get to where we are today. So this is something I'm super proud to be happening. But hey, let's start by talking uh, to listeners, taking them through your journey of being invited to this metaphysical church. Okay, guys. So when I was about eight, my family was invited to a group called Parents Without Partners. Mom, I understand that. I think that was from a Girl Scout recommendation, right? Do you know? I really don't remember how I got there, but I was looking for people that was in my category of situation. I'm a single mom, and Parents Without Partners sounded good. Okay, so we went there. We ate pizza. (laughs) We went there, and we heard... Someone speak dressed all in white, one of the clergy. And tell me what you remember. I think they had three of what they call gopis that were there. And um, I do believe one of them was named Morningstar. Three gopis. Wow. Yeah. And how big was the three. group meeting that? I don't remember that. It seemed like a Sorry. Lot, you know, from my recollection, it was full. Okay. The pizza house. By the end, uh, they demonstrated their uh, special talents like tarot, numerology, uh, astrology, and they invited everybody, anybody to come to their church and learn, take classes on these subjects. Well, we lived in North Long Beach and the church is way over in the east side. And you went. I did. Mm -hmm. I started taking classes. It was very interesting to me. Okay. Now, in the 80s, you were kicked out before us kids. Yes, it was uh, September of of 1984. Okay. I'll never forget that, by the way. It put me in a horrible position. Excommunicated is what I was told. I was taught to hate you, so I didn't go with you. Something I regret. So your first order of business, and of course, uh, there was a process of trying to get us out. 
And you said you tried to, from what I recall in our conversations, you tried to go to deprogrammers first? No, I went for uh, my own personal counseling. But before we get to that, you mentioned you knew the name Rick Ross at that time. And I, I know he runs a website now, Cult Education Institute, which is a website. But he was a deprogrammer. I didn't know that. Uh, there were two or three different people I was um, communicating with to see if it was even feasible for a child who had been in uh, an organization that is considered a cult and now is an adult, how hard it is for them to be um, transformed, if you will, taken taken. Um, changed their way of thinking about the cult. Yeah. And then how did you discover the counseling? Uh, my personal counseling. I, I went to, to somehow, I don't even remember who suggested it. I went to Jewish Federation. They have a Jewish family services there. And, and this uh, is LA, right? It was in Los Angeles. Correct. It okay. was a, it was a traveling situation, mm. but, uh, I had very few sessions, but I learned so much. I learned that there was um, a library, a special library uh, that the Jewish Federation had um, with different books on different uh, cults for anybody that was interested in learning about a certain cult. Okay. A well-known international library, one of the best or the best in the world. Wow. And I also learned about an organization called Cult Awareness Network. It was uh, designed to help people get educated on the topic of cults. Got it. Just like the name said. Mm -hmm. And it was a nonprofit organization. And it was pretty organized. Who was the LA leader? Priscilla Coates is the, was the Los Angeles county organizer and it was a national war um, across the nation so there were many people involved in this organization i started helping um doing their mailings and folding papers and like anybody getting things word out and was they had one of these organizations had you as a representative for people coming out of morningland that they could help you know get have conversations with someone who's actually been there? Who did that? Jewish Federation had a service that, uh, along with their library, if if anybody wanted to um, assist, and I did, I put my name on that list, and um, their intent was if they receive a phone call on any certain cult, they would then be allowed to give that phone number out mm. and have private communication on the subject. And you did that? I uh, did. With a group from Canada? A family from Canada called and wanted information. And it was a, I believe it was two different uh, husbands and wives oh. that were interested in information. And as I explained to them, I was a single person, so I uh, said that I would find a family, a husband-wife team that would be willing to talk to them, mm -hmm. which I did. And they, they later called me back and thanked me for all their information. Uh, only one out of their four decided to participate in Morningland. Oh, wow. And the thing is that I remember in the 80s, there was an outreach to Canada going on. So they were trying to expand. Wow. Ugh. Uh, one of the reasons I remember that is because a man read one of the leader's books. And he wrote a letter saying he was going to blow up Morningland for claiming to be Christ reincarnate. He was extremely upset. 
and then they tried to convert him and I don't know really you know where that went but yeah so I guess they had some events or went to conferences and met you know recruited people internationally they were doing some outreach in the later years the Frankie Files. Files. Okay, so then going back to Cult Awareness Network. Now, this is a really well-known group among many cult survivors. So Cult Awareness Network was available to the public, and they wanted to educate people about the danger of cults. Let's talk about one of the speakers you heard, Dr. Jolly West. Now, he's an expert from UCLA, but little known to you or I, I've recently found out he was involved in MK Ultra uh, from a podcast by Joe Rogan. He had someone on, I think it was Tom O'Neill, an author who spent many years trying to research this. And Jolly West went through his life saying, I will sue you if you ask me about MK Ultra." But there's links that prove he was involved. Uh, having said that, a very odd man and a very odd life he lived, but he was in, uh, spoke on hypnotism. So tell, me, tell us about that event. What was it like? My very first uh, national um, event to attend, and it was held in Chicago. And Jolly West and I rode the same plane. <laughs> and uh, uh, he did, I attended his lecture on uh hypnosis, and it was about an hour long, and um, it was very interesting, a lot of detail, and I felt, when I walked away, I felt like the idea of a cult was to introduce hypnosis very subtly, Mm -hmm. very, very subtly, and little at a time, and before you know it, you're hooked. Unethical hypnosis is used in recruitment and indoctrination in cults, and I did an episode on that recently. And it is shocking uh, using chanting, using music, using the environment. One of the things I discovered in the articles I read on that podcast on hypnosis was that they get us to hypnotize ourselves, self-hypnotize. It's, an, it's a training of the brain to get you to do it yourself. Wow. Because then um, hypnosis enables a high suggestibility of the brain. So I can see why they had him speak. It's really a component in cult indoctrination. Now, what about this woman who testified at the Jolly West lecture? Well, it was uh, at that same weekend. This... Um, uh event was a whole weekend long, started Friday night and ended Sunday afternoon. And during that, different episodes uh, took place. And uh, the lecture was, I believe, Saturday, so that everybody could attend. And the speaking engagement was either Saturday night or Sunday. And we were honored to have a number of young people, well, young to me, people that were uh, ex-cult members speak on their experience. Mm -hmm. And this one young lady, I don't remember the cult she was in, but what I do remember is a sentence that she said, and it has helped me for a very long time. She said, it's not that I didn't have doubts. It's that I could not act on them. Mm. Mm. And that fit in so right with what I learned at the lecture by Jolly West. And this, you know, goes to some of the questions people always ask. Well, how could you be so stupid as to be in a cult? How could you believe all that? Well, it's not right away that you believe all that. It's incrementally just noticeable differences that they navigate us away from our beliefs into indoctrination and further, you know, whole lifestyle, really. It's a disarming of your own senses and sensibility. Wow, interesting stuff. Another speaker you had is Steve Hassan, a very well-known now cult expert, 
And back then, he was on his first book, right? When I met Steve Hassan, it was at Priscilla Coates' home, where she had a meeting for Los Angeles group, and uh, Steve's first book. I bought his first book there and had a moment where I was speaking with him very early in his journey. And I know you were asking him about how to get us out because we were still there. You're trying to do research, and he he confirmed for you that trying to yank us out won't work. We'll just go right back. It never works. Like you, And I know that from my own experience. You have to have cracks in your belief to begin to think about leaving. The hold is too strong. So, yeah, we, and for listeners, we were still, the rest of my family was still in the cold when my mom had already left. So this poor thing is out trying to do research on how to basically make a rescue, but oof, it is rough. So Steve Hassan, was he cool to me in person? Oh, he's he was a sweetheart. Young young man that had his whole future in front of him. Yeah, he's done a lot of good rescuing people, informing people, writing books, 40 some years. So we owe a lot to him for this. Um, You know, I want to circle back a little bit. And uh, one of the conferences you spoke about in Chicago made an impression on me when we were talking one day and who was at the table that you attended, you know, who who else was at the table with you at this Cult Awareness Network conference? It was quite a surprise to uh, walk into the area where this was being held and have hundreds of people there. And I was shocked. I thought it was just going to be another small unit of people worldwide attended by all walks of life, all walks of life. And uh, we had open tables. So we sat down. They were circular tables. And this was the opening ceremonies. And to my left was a family of three, mother, father, and a child. And to their left was a priest. And next to him was a rabbi. And next to him was a policeman. Hmm. And then me. Wow. Uh, We had a lot to talk about. And we were all thrilled to meet each other. What did you guys talk about? Well, the priest was very interested. He's been studying cults. And uh, what organization did he belong to? Catholic priest. Oh. Yes. Sitting next to a rabbi. <laughs> non denominational interest. Uh, this was education. It was trying to help educate themselves. And even a policeman wanted to be educated on the topic. Yeah. Hmm. And parents and kids and ex members. Everybody was mingling together. Sounds like it did a lot of good. I think so. It did for me. And we say did because, getting to the next point in this conversation, the Jewish Federation Library no longer exists. Let's talk about that. Their International Library of Cult Literature no longer exists. Why is that? There was a long process initiated by Scientology, and they sued the Jewish Federation and Cult Awareness Network. And I'm not sure of the all the details, legal details, But the outcome was the judge giving Scientology the entire collection of of these books. That's my understanding. I don't have a copy of the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But But it's no longer available to the public. No longer exists at all. And Mm -hmm. Cult Awareness Network was to uh, give up their title. Uh, they no longer are. Oh, that's a whole other topic. Network, let's, let's get into that. Which I don't understand. They were sued by Scientology, several lawsuits, and then the end result is it belongs to them now. Yes. Whew. Cult now owns Cult Awareness Network. And I'm sure they would argue that they're a religion. And, you know, big topic there, religion versus cult, but uh, they're cultic. I mean... You're not allowed. And this is where, you know, people silence others who are leaving a cult, just like us. We've been concerned about the retribution, about speaking out. Being Having our family separated was a traumatic experience. 
We didn't do anything wrong. The Frankie Files. But it's taken us 20, you know, 30, 40 years to say, you know, I'm not going to be silent about this anymore. Why? Because I see the resurgence of cults. It's not going anywhere. They're stronger than ever. And just taking an example, just taking as an example, Scientology, and I, I would like to include Morningland, must actively silence their members or some of these members would have spoken out before this. I am now the only person speaking out about Morningland publicly as of this broadcast. I'm happy to be at this point where I can and I'm happy to have the support of my mom. It's almost a miracle that we're talking. Isn't it? I think so. The rest of our family knows we're doing it, but isn't necessarily interested in participating. We cleared it, though, and that's important because no one wants to re-traumatize someone who's been traumatized by a church. But the fact that uh, Scientology owns Narcotics Anonymous, a lot of people don't even know that. The underhanded methods that are used to recruit is one of my pet peeves. And we can talk about Jehovah's Witness and other uh, groups. Morningland was involved in that too. The human trafficking is vital to keep money and free labor coming in. And, you know, I was involved in child labor. There is no doubt about it. We thought we were working for the good of the whole. So at the peril of the individual is the part that is my pet peeve. But of course, if any of you have... Um, contributions regarding Morningland. We'd love to hear them. You can reply to this broadcast and you can find more contact information by going to frankietees.com. So Cult Awareness Network no longer exists as it did, but it stayed the same name. I'm astounded by that. So it's almost like to fool people thinking it's still a resource to help you. Certainly it'll be a recruitment into... <laughs> Scientology. Now, Morningland, Morningland still exists for those of you who are in Long Beach and or ex-members, uh, but, and it's run by the same leaders. I personally have confirmed this, okay? It's run by the same people that were trained by the founders who are now deceased. They've named themselves the monastery and the fact that there is almost no information publicly is one of the biggest things to me that shows there's probably things going on that are not right. They still have their property. They've scooted through every lawsuit, including bribery charges. And I talk about this and much more my personal family story in my book, which I'm working to get published. It's not published yet. Uh, but today we only wanted to touch on the surface of this very long story and really just share with you our personal victory of coming back together. We did it. We did it. We are still doing it. We're doing it. And, you know, I can't tell you how much it means to me to... And we never thought this would happen. ...to be here and... I know. Have you on this broadcast. It's a great day. It is. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, everybody, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to frankietees.com for information on our GoFundMe, Cash App, Redbubble, PayPal, Buy Me a Cup of Coffee. You can submit a comment to share on the broadcast It'll be an audio recording you make, and then I can share it with others. We'd love to hear the feedback from others who are in Morningland. This is just beginning, guys. It's just the beginning. Thanks for listening. Until next time.